you. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I'm thrilled to see that we have a turnout that isn't completely pathetic for the size of the room. Uh, <laughs> we're here to talk about um, women in the Paleolithic, searching for them in particular. So with that, I will hand off to Virginia. We would like to welcome our first speaker, Meg Conkey, who's going to be talking to us about some theoretical musings on finding women in the Paleolithic. Why and where? Well, this room is probably quite a good metaphor for the uh, place of women in our accounts of the Paleolithic. There are scattered few, but the rest are empty. So, okay, let's see if I've got this set up here. Um, <clears throat> when I wrote out the abstract, and uh, even when I started writing the paper, I had a quite simple notion in mind. I wanted to challenge, yes, in fact challenge, on a number of grounds that we should continue to focus on so-called searching for women in the Paleolithic which is, of course, an idea central to the session. I was thinking that in the ways in which the so-called search for women had been taken up, that we had missed some possibilities for other dimensions of understanding the Paleolithic social worlds. Furthermore, I thought, and I actually still think, that there are some inherent ontological and epistemological problems of this idea of searching and recovering, even if there have been some gains. I mean, basically, I don't think we really are in the business of quote unquote finding women in any sort of straightforward way. And when we do make them visible in whatever way, the troubling part is that they don't tend, that don't they tend to be made visible in very familiar ways. And this is what Burton once called optical illusions, that women are made visible but in constrained and very modernist sorts of ways as if they were just an extension of our lives. So what would happen if what we saw, see if we can get this to move forward, if what we saw could not really be apprehended and it was not particularly archeological, that it was very ambiguous and amorphous. Well, of course it's not a simple, straightforward inquiry to say that we need to have other stories and narratives and accounts, of course, empirically based of the Paleolithic, but that women or men, for that matter, cannot be recovered. And then if we say that, we need to lay out what we nonetheless can do. So once I got into the weeds, as the saying goes, things got very complicated and very ambiguous. So in the spirit of this being a small, and accomplished group to be led by our discussant, I'm gonna try to stumble through here a somewhat contorted consideration of some ideas around these preliminary notions. So the first full disclosure is that I've rewritten this presentation several times and it's still not what I wanted. Second disclosure is that I am as prone as anyone being tempted to find or even recover women in the Paleolithic. Now I've just had the occasion to co-author or join in authorship on a paper in the Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory, which attests to my still being tempted to find or recover women in the Paleolithic because in this inquiry uh, with uh, Fritz and Tosello about the roles and identities of the makers of the Paleolithic arts, one of our first questions was, and what if it were a woman, the challenge of engendering? Now admittedly, this was a question that was raised by my French co-authors in the first version of the paper before I joined in as a translating and supporting author. And to be sure, the attention of most aspects of a social archeology, span much less an interest in gender or feminist theory in the prehistory community of France is barely existent. So this was a novel question for them, given that so much of the engendering work in archeology span and prehistory uh, had not been done in France or in French. But still, I went along with this question. And of course, one we had to complicate uh, from the very start. And of course, complicating meant that we had to recognize that it's in contemporary culture, gender is complicated. Many of us may have appreciated these signs for what people are needing to do for restrooms these days, since gender is increasingly complicated in contemporary societies, which should be a lesson to us. 
But one of the reasons I went along, as we note in the paper, is that it is surely the case that there still is a notable lack of females or women, at least as what we understand them to be, in both the artist's reconstructions of the making of Paleolithic arts, except those by co-author Gilles Tosello, whose women actors um, are nonetheless of a certain genre, often being blonde and with blue eyes. <clears throat> and of course, there is also a uh, lack of uh, women, females, uh, in the accounts of Paleolithic activities, societies, and life ways. In fact, the androcentrisms of reconstructions and accounts of life in the Paleolithic is so ingrained that sometimes, even when women are quite literally in the picture, they are not seen. And I recently gave a lecture to what I thought was a smart group of undergraduates at Berkeley, and two women students came up after the lecture to ask about the general, uh, in general, about the roles of women in image making. Uh, where are they? You know, what do we know? And they. And I refer to several of the artist reconstructions that I had shown, such as this one that's now on the right-hand side. When I pointed out to them that there sometimes, rarely, are women depicted in such as in this example, they were horrified to say that they hadn't even noticed the woman. All they had noticed were the men at the left. So their vision itself had been skewed, and even when visible, the woman was not quote-unquote seen. Now, there have been a number of attempts and in-depth attention to such things as the social or agency, but for the most part, the landscape of Paleolithic archaeology is still stones and bones and even art, usually, but not always, without actors, even if there are apprentices, accomplished engravers, inter- and intra-regional relationships, manifestations of symbolism, presumed trade and exchange, and so forth, but it is still mostly at a macro scale and full of abstract processual sounding concepts that don't really get much attention or detailed or thought about individuals, actors, agency, identities, much less about entanglements, embodiedness, or other trending concepts that are bandied about in some of contemporary archaeology. Of course, there are some voices in research that are increasingly nibbling at the edges of the strong androcentric and macro scale prevailing uh, paradigms. The work, of course, of Olga Sofer and her colleagues, the work of Van Gelder and Sharp on the finger flutings, or April Noel on childhood and the learning of Paleolithic art, to name only a few. But the questions our organizers have raised as have as much to do with not just the archaeology and paleoanthropology of the Paleolithic, but the way popular culture has, of course, bought in uh, to uh, the deeply problematic stereotypes. And so, of course, you can see. Um, I don't know if you can see the uh, cartoon up at the upper right. It says, I don't, you don't suppose men are going to get credit for this too, do you? <clears throat> so one of the additional questions here is not only what we might quote unquote find out about women in the upper Paleolithic or the, all of the Paleolithic, but how can this enact change? Thus, on the one hand, when attempting to engage in theoretical musings, we have to admit that we cannot set aside the impulse to not just people the Paleolithic past, but also bring in the absolutely central women of those societies into the picture and narratives, if not also into the attempts to interpret and understand what might have been going on in the Paleolithic past. As Sylvia Tomoshkova once pointed out so astutely, if we do not even imagine and make explicit the range of human experiences of multiple past actors and groups, this, in effect, denies that such experiences ever existed. How could one think that Paleolithic women sat around and waited for some guy to make her stone tools, especially as she butchered the much heralded kill. This is not merely, I think we can now agree, a need to find women to recover them, and thus to use this information to lead to a more nuanced understanding of the social and cultural dynamics of Paleolithic life. Rather, this attempt to recover and thus insert other actors in varied roles into the story should be attempt to complicate and yet render ever more ambiguous and even open-ended what we think we know so far. But should this be our key goal some 30 years since the visible beginnings of trying to engender archaeology and the archaeological past? What might we have missed and what other pathways have we not taken because this search for the women of the Paleolithic that has not been all that successful, if we are still working away at it so hard, have we been too, too seduced by trying to engage in gender attributions? What do we want from making women visible? So in the rest of this presentation, I want to quickly address several questions. 
What is thought to be gained from a search for the women of the Paleolithic? And two, has this impulse to find and recover women limited us in some ways, while admittedly often opening new doors and insights? And does this matter? What is to be gained from finding or recovering the women of the Paleolithic? Of course, this is a topic for the entire session and way beyond, but I would suggest here just a couple of goals. First, whatever we quote unquote find out, whether it be a somewhat direct observation, such as in the several burials that we have of identifiable females, such as sites like Don Vestanici, uh, Sungir, Saint Germain en Laye, or Saint Germain La Riviere, or El Miron from Spain, and of course, have to ask ourselves who this looks like, or indirect inferences that make some sense, assuming that for the most part, these Paleolithic peoples required the effective labor and sociocultural skills of as many people as possible, as well as open up stereotypes to scrutiny, such as uh, Sylvia Tomoshkova has done on the gender of shamans um, here on the left, or as Olga Sofer has on the likely makers of some of the female figurines. Second, this complication should be key to addressing serious contemporary issues of how a presumed past, a paleo past, is drawn upon to naturalize and substantiate current gendered practices, including violence against women and patriarchy in its many problematic forms. Perhaps the current vogue of the so-called paleo diet is in um, paleo muffins at our local cafe in Berkeley, uh, <clears throat> perhaps the current vogue of this so-called paleo diet is in its food promotions, somewhat neutral, but it nonetheless evokes to many the man, the hunter, caveman icons and idols. Mary McCoffey has uh, challenged the evolutionary psychologically based notions of the persistence of the caveman ideal, such as do we really need to release the inner caveman? <clears throat> And even she has suggested that this has in fact constrained contemporary males in what she calls the caveman mystique, analogous to Betty Friedan's feminine mystique. But frankly, we desperately need a sustained intervention such as what the guerrilla girls have done um, for the perpetuation of caveman ideology. Um, and of course, if we engaged in this, we would have to contend with New Yorker cartoons, popularized accounts of human behavior. So I'm not actually sanguine that too much can change, which should not, however, deter us from pressing forward with our complicating accounts. And of course, there are some interesting, very viable, and important alternatives. Thirdly, and as I have written elsewhere about this, I concur with feminist writer Cynthia Epstein that whenever we look for the women, we will find out something new, something interesting, something important. She urges us to recognize that to be a good feminist, we must be resolutely curious. And this is why I push forward on the notion that we must move beyond the ontological and epistemological barriers of finding or recovering women. Now, if we do want to disrupt the prevailing anthrocentric accounts that include representations of the Paleolithic that fit familiar stereotypes, this is pretty new terrain for most Paleolithic archaeologists. We are so often brought down by the skepticisms that come from how we work in deep time, how we lack ethnographic and ethnohistoric informants, and thus are overly swayed by and dependent upon the ethnographies of hunters and gatherers who themselves are often made out to be more familiar than strange in our humanistic universalizing. Why, for example, does the so-called division of labor all across the Paleolithic world have to be a dichotomous one based on our interpretations of biological sex? It doesn't have to have been that way. <clears throat> so for starters, I have three final thoughts already anticipated, what I might call the three Cs. So following Epstein, curiosity, uh, what are we curious about? Curiosity, complicate, and context. How does being curious about something actually have the potential and actual unanticipated result of our learning something new and something about women? Was, we have to ask her, she's right here ourselves, was Sylvia mostly curious about how the idea that all shamans were men came about? Look what it led to, a fantastic analysis of the history of the concept of this idea. We know that Olga Sofer was very curious about these little teeny tiny pieces of uh, baked clay that she found in the Doni Vestavici storage area, which turned out to have weaving impressions on them, which she links to possibly women as weavers. 
and how those folks who've been analyzing the new burials of Magdalenian females been curious about anything more their than just their depositional context, how the ornaments were made, or some generalized notions of status. What extra things could be asked of them? We need to take the familiar and make them strange, and what better way to destabilize than to do some reversals? And of course, here's a reversal of the um, one attempt at reversing females as not being tool makers. I'm not sure this is completely successful, but it's a start. The guy behind there looks like she's crazy. What's she doing? Linked with being curious are the what ifs. What if women were the ones to butcher the animals or that they did understand human anatomy well enough to uh, made images or even be involved in hunting? What if, as Francoise Odoux and colleagues observed at the Magdalenian side of Verbury and the Paris Basin, that a supposed hunting site oh, had evidences of unskilled tool making suggesting a more diverse group occupied the site than man the hunter, including perhaps children and other learners? What then is a hunting camp and why there are so many of them and so relatively few other types of occupied spaces? How do we complicate the narratives, the accounts, and how do we come up with multiple possible interpretations rather than shutting things down? And here I'll turn to my own work. Why has nobody critiqued my oversighted 1980 work suggesting the existence of upper Paleolithic aggregation sites? There are no people in my accounts, much less any gender or other social identities. What, how can we complicate this? And this has been 35 years, so somebody better get going. So lastly, uh, what is it about the context of uh, Paleolithic life ways that we can probe and push so we can infer more about the social personae, about the performances and practices that might not fit so snugly into a single interpretive story? In summing up, I've been suggesting we should not limit ourselves to the ontologically and epistemologically strangled so-called search for women in the, upper, in the Paleolithic. After all, isn't some of archaeology actually finally grappling a little bit with the ontological limits of our practice? And this is a search that tends to take the tack of trying to cover, recover women. Rather, I'm suggesting we have to provoke our curiosities, harness our abilities to complicate, not merely get all tangled up in gender attribution, and redefine what we mean by context and reimagine the context as equally strange as familiar. Thank you. And this, of course, is the elephant in the room. All right, next up we have Melanie Chang uh, presenting uh, for her work and for April Noel's work, uh, A Census of Women in the Paleolithic. Hi. <laughs> so, well, in the early 1990s, uh, Saturday Night Live ran regular skits starring a character named Pat that some of you may remember, whose amorphously shaped body and awkward, ambiguous mannerisms made it impossible for anyone who interacted with Pat to determine Pat's biological sex. Stymied by their inability to first categorize Pat as a man or a woman, they found it impossible to move on to any other kind of normal social interaction. Pat goes to the gym to talk to a personal trainer who is unable to determine whether Pat wants to lose weight or get pumped up. Or Pat goes to the hairdresser, um, a skit starring George Wendt, who some of you may have remembered from Cheers, um, who has no idea what style Pat might desire for a formal event. The central joke of the skit was not in and of itself that Pat was sex or gender ambiguous, but rather lay entirely in how deeply uncomfortable this made everyone around Pat, and what outlandish lengths they would go to in their attempts to determine what Pat was. Well. We have this problem in human evolutionary studies, too, in which our first instinct is also to project and apply these sorts of binary norms that are very normal to us in our societal context and underlie all of our social relationships, maybe because we lack the necessary distance from our subjects that we would have if we were studying the origins of flowering plants or archaic snails or giant rhinoceroses. When we describe the fossil of an archaic human, one of the basic tasks of building a biological profile involves, much as in forensic contexts, an attempt to identify the biological sex of the individual. 
Specimens of even quite ancient hominins, such as Australopithecus, uh, excuse me, Australopithecus afarensis, are routinely identified as male or female, with concomitant inter interpretations about the biological, ecological, and social roles of that individual following thereafter. Big males must have competed with each other for mates. Small, passive females were controlled and provisioned by these big males, and so on. But there's a dirty little secret in human paleontology, and that is that we don't actually know and can't, in many or even most cases in the absence of DNA evidence, know whether a given fossil was biologically male or female, because the necessary skeletal elements for identifying sex in modern humans are not present. And at any rate, we can't assume that these indicators would be valid in archaic populations to begin with. Sexing hominin fossils therefore relies on general patterns derived from our own species, which incidentally vary between populations, and our closest living relatives, and often fall back on general ideas about robusticity and overall size, and even broader assumptions which in practice usually boil down to big, tough-looking fossils are male, and small, more cute or delicate or pretty fossils are considered female. Now, these interpretations are based in biology, but they are also colored by our internalized, somewhat emotional, and socially constructed interpretations of masculinity and femininity. That said, modern human males can be delicate and pretty, and modern human females can be robust and muscular, and also pretty tough. Sorry, I don't have an updated slide of Ronda Rousey getting kicked in the face by Holly Holm, but. Likewise, our interpretations of human representations in the Upper Paleolithic are fraught with bias and laden with emotion. I don't need to explain the history of these interpretations in the present company. I'd be kind of intimidated to do it personally, but um, as a biological anthropologist, I've always found these interpretations to be extremely interesting. Not so much in cases like this image from Losel, which is clearly and unambiguously marked by sex characteristics such as large pendulous breasts, over ana overall anatomical proportions, and apparent fat distributions as biologically female. But there are many cases that are either ambiguous or that completely lack primary or secondary sex characteristics and yet are often unproblematically read by researchers as biologically female based on soft associations between sex and things like hairstyles or conventions of illustration, what Kelly Hayes Gilpin referred to as markers of gender. It is easy to imagine that the sculpture is of a beautiful young woman with an elaborate hairstyle, maybe because it conforms so well to the conventions of classical Western sculpture. But as Dr. Conkey has previously pointed out, couldn't this just as easily be a he as a she, maybe a handsome young man with braided hair? And we can, and some have, extend this inquiry to the more abstract or schematic engravings and sculptures from the Magdalenia and what Bon and Vertu referred to as stylized females. Um, I like that she's smiling this photo, by the way. Um, this semi-seated, almost quadrupedal looking posture that is inferred here is, is really odd and not opposed that any woman, that any woman or, or human in general um, habitually assumes, unless maybe you're doing squats and CrossFit at the gym or something like that. Um, Leroy Gron, noted the animalistic nature of many of these representations, which begs the question of whether they could actually be animals. Likewise, some of what have been termed true composite animal human rep representations, like the bird man from Lascaux, are pretty clearly male in the schematized representation, but others that are often considered male, like the lion man of Hollenstein Stadel, are not. This figurine not only lacks human secondary sex characteristics or primary sex characteristics, but also lacks the full mane of most adult male lions. Why are these ambiguous figures identified as male? And then there are the vulvas, or what we in paleoanthropology routinely refer to as vulvas in upper paleolithic art, following interpretations dating back to the early 1900s. This is something that we routinely do, even though, as far as I can tell, everybody knows they probably aren't really vulvas, as Stoliar and Bon and others, some of whom are in this room, have pointed out on numerous occasions beforehand. And there are often disclaimers to this effect in manuscripts. And yet, and I don't mean to pick on anyone in particular because they're hardly the only ones, we still do it. And then we go on with our further interpretations as though that is what they really are. Now, I can't really answer the question of why we keep calling them vulvas, but April Noel and I had a couple of questions that we think can be addressed by dispassionate and empirical examinations of the Upper Paleolithic record. This is a work in progress, so I apologize that my presentation today is somewhat incomplete, but our hope is that this session will help us to tailor our inquiries and inform the interpretations of our conclusions. So I'm counting on you guys. 
Now, first we ask, what does, the, does the anatomy that is putatively illustrated, since these representations may not be anatomical, actually resemble human female genital anatomy? Pretty simple question. The second question is, do the disembodied vulvas pictured in Upper Paleolithic art, or representational schemes, or whatever you want to call them, um, resemble depictions of human female anatomy that is actually attached to depictions of unambiguously biological human female bodies? Now, this latter inquiry has been suggested by Paul Bonn on a number of occasions, but it's not clear that anyone has ever systematically actually done this. So first things first, let's get this out of the way. Most of the images we are talking about do not look like human vulvas. Sorry. Um, uh, but no, not only because most of these images, because these images are very eclectic. Now, I understand that Leroy Garon did not actually consider all of these female signs to actually represent female anatomy. But because human vulvas actually look like this, not like those, um, and all of the putative vulva images, uh, of all of the putative vulva images we've looked at thus far, only this one from Koske actually looks somewhat like a vulva. But it is, as far as we can tell, a singular or one of very few representations in this style. Otherwise, what we are actually talking about are putative representations of pubic triangles or frontal views of female anatomy that include the mons pubis, the very anterior portion of the vulvar cleft or slit, and lower quadrants of the abdomen above it. Now, it is clear that the various images described by Deluc and Deluc and others as vulvas or as sex femina, in most cases at least superficially resemble frontal views of the pubic triangle, at least if they are oriented in a certain way, although they are presented in a variety of ways in situ when they are actually viewed in caves or in other contexts. But they, as well as the region of the body they are said to represent, lack a whole lot of validating details and also resemble all sorts of other things, like hoof prints or placentas, or molar teeth. I mean, I, I'm a biological anthropologist. I see teeth when I see these things. I can't help it. Or bird feet, for example. I, I should say Paul Bond thought this was one of the few unquestionable isolated instances of vulvar imagery in the, in the record. And, and I generally agree with a lot of what he writes, but I don't agree with that one. Um, so our next task is to identify unambiguously biologically female full figure representations using strict criteria, meaning the presence of unambiguous primary or secondary sex characteristics, generally breasts and anatomical proportions or apparent fat distributions. Now, of the 50 plus full figure unambiguously biologically female representations we have examined images of thus far, over two thirds have relevant regions that are depicted as triangles, either with or without a median line representing presumably the vulvar cleft. Now this interpretation or this depiction can also be extended to otherwise ambiguous images such as the Ampudique from Logerie Basse and the Frise from Rocco Sorcier, both of which lack defined breasts. Actually, most people go, come on, that looks female to you. Okay, I sort of buy that, I guess. Although other unambiguous females like Dolny Vestinitsa lack a pubic triangle altogether. Now, Something curious about the entire Upper Paleolithic ovra, except possibly the bison woman vulva from Chauvet down on the lower left-hand side there, is that, the mature fe is that mature fecund human women usually have some amount of pubic hair, and this is usually the most visible attribute of the pubic triangle from the front. Yet, it is not portrayed in Paleolithic representations, despite the fact that hair or presumed hair covers or styles or headwear um, is sometimes depicted on the head in, in quite some detail. This could be taken to indicate that many images are of prepubescent females, or that, like women in classical Greece and Rome, Paleolithic women habitually removed their body hair, or it could represent a convention of representation that we can't fully understand. Whether or not Paleolithic women actually went full Brazilian, it is clear that only triangle vulvas actually resemble the pubic triangles of full figure female representations. While it is possible that Paleolithic peoples had different conventions for depicting isolated female anatomy versus female anatomy in context, i.e. as part of a human figure, this is something that would have to be demonstrated rather than assumed. But could this similarity represent a shared culturally embedded representational system? If so, then an extended argument could be made supporting the identification of isolated sex femina as female anatomical representations. A complicating factor here is that multiple representational conventions are often seen at single sites, such as at La Pharisee, which does not mean that, all of, that none of these represent female anatomy, but perhaps that it is unlikely that all of them represent female anatomy. 
putatively female representations occur over vast geographical areas in the Upper Paleolithic, which complicates the identification of cultural traditions, or what Ian Davidson referred to as conventionalized packaging of arbitrariness, but another major obstacle to tying similar looking signs from different sites together as part of a single representational tradition is that there is a lack of chronological resolution. When part of a single, oh sorry, when attempting to connect two or more images in the same cave, even on the same panel, for example, we have to remember that they could have been painted generations apart, thousands and thousands of years. Now, a classic example concerns some of the black images of bison at the cave of Nyon, which were probably painted at least 1,000 years apart. Um, in this case, they are stylistically pretty much indistinguishable, but the pigments used to create them were manufactured following different recipes that are found at other sites that have very different dates. Um, this is a cautionary tale about assuming that all of the images on a panel, um, let alone in a cave, let alone among several caves, um, could be considered to be contemporary. Related to this is a lack of overall chronological control. Um, only about 5% of painted caves have been chronometrically dated, which is not only a depressingly small number, but the sites that are directly dated are unequally distributed among time periods. In a previous study, April and Genevieve von Petzinger found that while 30% of all Aurignacian and Gravedian parietal art sites are either directly dated or indirectly dated using chronometric methods like um, carbon-14 dates of nearby occupation layers, only 3% of Salutrian and Magdalenian sites have such dates. Um, this is a bar graph showing you the percentage of Magdalenian sites that are dated or um, putatively dated using a number of different methods. Um, the Salutrian and Magdalenian sites were much more likely to be stylistically dated. 79% of all Salutrian sites and 62% of all Magdalenian sites are stylistically dated, as opposed to 57% of Gravedian sites and 0% of Ardnation sites. Now, I realize this is a very complicated figure. Compounding these difficulties is the fact that many of these stylistically dated sites were stylistically dated based on perceived connections to other sites that are also stylistically dated, which is what part of what you're seeing here, rather than using the few chronometrically dated sites as anchor points, which is illustrated in this rather complicated flowchart. Um, direct dates for parietal art are only known from seven sites, actually, um, Chauvet, Cosquet, Cognac, uh, Le Portel, Mayenne, Science, Mio, and Peshmerl. So because of this, we have established in our minds a sequence for the development of art that is to some degree based on circular reasoning and expectations of what we should see at, during certain periods. Um, but we may ask if, for example, Chauvet had been discovered early in the history of Paleolithic rock art research as opposed to recently, and we'd been able to date it back then, how might that have changed our expectations of future, the expectations of future researchers? So what of the circle vulvas? Our analysis confounds the identification of circular vulvas from um, sites like Abri Castanet as what has been called the most ancient form of female imagery. This form is also commonly considered a type fossil of the French Aurignacian. At any rate, none of these rounded forms actually resemble the pubic triangle found on full figure female representations. So why are we harping on this? Who cares if everyone knows what that, that they really aren't vulvas anyway? Well, one of the reasons is illustrated by this image, which I found when I was going online to find easily stealable images for this um, presentation. Um, uh, th this image is of the disembodied vulva or the unidentified possibly pubic object or UPPO, which is terminology I would, I would put forward here, um, from Aubrey Castanet. And my first thought was when I looked at the headline, well, if this actually is a vagina, then that's something because that means it's an anatomical, you know, internal anatomical diagram from the Paleolithic and that would be kind of crazy. But my next thought was wonder that the young wired hipsters who read io9.com, which is for young wired hipsters, would really be interested in Paleolithic engravings. But the thing is, people really are interested in this stuff, even outside of our field, probably for at least a couple of reasons. Uh, modern people tend to be pretty interested in sex, meaning intercourse and images of sex and anatomy related to sex and all of that kind of stuff. And the second reason is that sexual interpretations of Paleolithic images feed into the narrative that modern day predilections, which are culturally embedded, are natural and have been with us since the distant mists of prehistoric time. This narrative in turn projects modern gender constructs and conventions, including those regarding who possesses the gaze and who is the object of it, and men who have agency and women who are passive um, into the past. 
we as scientists should recognize when we are in danger of projecting these constructs in our own work and also be cognizant of when we are complicit in communicating these projections to the public. These quotes are from a Nature article describing the Argnation figure from Holy Fells. And this is what results when these statements filter through to the general public. As you can see, men's brains are designed to objectify females. A final problem is that by repeatedly reinforcing these assumptions, we are potentially cutting off a whole line of inquiry regarding what these putatively female signs represent and how they are integrated into the broader corpus of upper Paleolithic art. However, if we want to expand that inquiry, then we might get a chance to learn more about who our ancestors were rather than looking at a reflection of ourselves that feeds the media, but tells us little about who we are now and perhaps even less about who we were then. Thank you. So next up is Caroline Van Sickle talking about In Search of Mothers in the Paleolithic. I'm here to talk about mothers in the Paleolithic. I should have used the pointer. I want you to think back to the first time in an anthropology class that you talked about human evolution. Odds are pretty good, regardless of when that first class was for you, that the viewpoint that was given, the story that you heard, looked something like this. It looked like men doing the interesting things, holding the clubs, the stone tools, the spears, and women sitting in the background holding babies, if women were even mentioned at all. This leads to an idea about human evolution that is incredibly androcentric. It's the male version of what was going on. But we know from the fossils, and we know from our own logic, females were there. It wasn't just about men, there was more going on. The term gender is difficult to apply to the past, we don't know what genders existed in the past, and we don't know what importance was given to the concept of gender, if it existed, um, and what roles were associated with that. But we do know that biological sex existed, and we can tell this in some cases from the fossil record. When it comes to looking at female bodies, we can identify features that are associated with motherhood. The difficulty, though, is that Again, some of the stories that get told in paleoanthropology about mothers don't really put mothers in a very good light. Being a mother was hard. You required more nutrients than your male counterparts. You were always carrying a baby either in, in your room or just carrying it outside. You had wide hips that might make you worse at walking. That one's actually been challenged recently and, uh, and rejected uh, in a paper by Anna Warner and her team. Uh, where they actually tested men and women on treadmills, how much energy are they expending when they walk, and regardless of pelvic width, turns out, doesn't matter. It's the same amount of energy for everyone. But the story in the, pa in the Paleolithic is really one of motherhood as being difficult. All these adaptations, all these specialities that uh, female bodies needed to be able to have, to give birth and to have babies, made them somehow less than. I think about this a lot in my research. And one thing that I think about is what, what can we do to change this story? And what evidence do we have to really base it on? The first line of evidence that I think of is can we actually do anything to identify which bodies in the past gave birth? Can we identify mothers from the skeletal evidence? In modern humans, we have uh, features on the pelvis called partuition scars that are associated with birth, they're associated with partuition. Uh, these appear as deep pits that appear on the back of the pubis and in front of the sacroiliac joint. And the idea behind these is that um, there's ligaments there that are stretching out during uh, the birth process um, and 
especially with women who give birth multiple times, they can actually start to affect the shape of the bone and cause these deep pits. So it's not a guarantee that every mother is going to have parturition pits, but if you have them, the assumption is that, okay, you're looking at someone who has given birth. There's some iffy things with this. Um, this is an individual from the Bass Collection at the University of Tennessee, and if we zoom in on the preauricular surface, there are indeed some deep pits there that could be termed parturition scars. The difficulty, though, is that this particular individual is a 450-pound man. I can pretty much guarantee he was not giving birth. So it seems that there are some other features that can, or some other behaviors or uh, things that can cause this uh, scars to pop up. When we look at the fossil record, we don't see parturition scars in it. So they aren't actually useful there, even if they were consistent in um, how they display in modern humans today. This means when it comes to trying to identify mothers in the fossil record, the best we can do is identify who had the potential ability to be a mother, even if we can't identify who actually had given birth. Well, again, when looking at modern humans, we can distinguish a male pelvis from a female pelvis. The feature I'm going to focus on today is the, greater, the width of the greater sciatic notch, which is wider in females than it is in males, in humans today. This has to do with the birth canal, the fact that when uh, female bodies need a birth canal. Uh, and so by increasing the width of that notch, as you can see on the picture on the left here, sorry, on the right, um, which is a male pelvis, by increasing that distance, you would actually increase the anterior posterior space of what would be the birth canal if this were a female bodied person. That makes it possible for a baby's head to fit through there. So, this is how great, the greater sciatic notch in particular uh, is an adaptation for birth. Well, we have some greater sciatic notches that we find in uh, the fossil record. So, the question is can we estimate sex based on those? I'm going to take you through time going back. We won't hit every stop, I promise. Uh, but in Neanderthals, we do have some very complete pelvic remains. Um, the taboon female pelvis here is being reconstructed in different ways by different teams. It's not totally complete. But when we look at the, fo the original fossils themselves, we can identify a greater sciatic notch in what should be a male uh, individual based on the rest of the, body, the skeleton that we have and what should be a female. And they do appear to have the exact same pattern that we see in humans, in humans today. The male kabara has a narrow notch, the female taboon has a very wide notch. If we go back in time a little further to Homo erectus, uh, here I'm gonna focus on the Narikotomi boy pelvis and the Gona pelvis. Narikotomi boy has been reconstructed and so if you have a copy in your lab, you might be used to seeing this picture on the left here. Um, but I want to point out that the front part of this pelvis, I don't know how to, yeah, right here, um, it's darkened out because it's actually completely made up. Um, and so we don't know that this is actually what this pelvis would have looked like here. But if you look at the pieces of the pelvis itself, you can identify um, the greater sciatic notch. I've highlighted it in white over there. And it's, again, much more narrow than the um, Gona one highlighted uh, on the right. Now, the difficulty with this, though, is that there's a lot of debate in paleoanthropology over it, whether or not Gona actually is Homo erectus. Um, it's not a very appropriate comparison to Narragotomi if it's not the same species. But if we take the, as a base that these are the same species, it does appear that this is something that was sexually dimorphic in Homo erectus. Australopithecus sediba, it's the same thing. Here we have two individuals, a male and a female. And the male has a narrow greater sciatic notch, and the female has a wide one. Australopithecus robustus is a bit more difficult. These notches are very similar to each other. They are both U-shaped. Sometimes there's a distinguish between uh, modern males have a more J-shaped uh, notch. It's narrow and J-shaped, whereas uh, it's more evenly distributed and U-shaped in females. And these notches could both be considered female if you were to find them in a human sample. So it doesn't appear that the greater sciatic notch was as dimorphic in uh, robustus. The problem here being that we don't have a very large sample. We don't have a lot of other individuals to compare this to, so it might just be something weird about these particular two. Afarensis, we have a similar problem. Both of these kind of look J-shaped. So here we're looking at the Lorenzo Milley male uh, individual and at Lucy. 
And while Lucy is wide, it's actually not nearly as wide as Ron's and Lily looks, um, but they're both kind of more J-shaped than U-shaped, and so the greater sciatic notch looks less sexually dimorphic in uh, this Australopithecus species than we would expect given what we know about modern humans. This kind of leads to a story. It leads to a story where we could have our old idea about what is sexually dimorphic in the pelvis being determined by brain size. Australopiths have a small brain size, so they don't need as many adaptations in their female pelvis in order to be able to give birth to their small-brained infants. Um, this means we wouldn't expect as much sexual dimorphism in Australopiths as we would uh, in the genus Homo, where brain size increases and increases. But you have to remember Australopithecus sediba was sexually dimorphic. Uh, Australopithecus sediba um, is a small brain Australopithecus species, but it challenges this idea, this pattern that would be set up um, based on brain size not being in or being the key thing that brings about uh, sexual dimorphism in the pelvis. So where can we go from here? I know looking at one feature of the pelvis is maybe not the most exciting thing to do, but a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, this is the evidence that paleoanthropologists are going to for actually identifying sex in the fossil record. And they base conclusions about the pelvis, about what females were capable of doing, about what mothers were doing on this type of evidence. Where I hope we can go from here is this is an idea of, yeah, sorry. I hope we can go from here is changing our ideas about how we identify sex, what our criteria are, how many individuals we require. We think we can identify sex with one pelvis. I think we're mistaken. We really need to have at least two. And even then, that's not a really a very good sample size. But sample size isn't the full problem. You might think that with over 1,500 fossils from a single site, uh, as is the case with the new hominin species, Homo naledi, that we'd have a good sample size, that we would be able to tell, okay, these ones are male, these ones are female, it's very clear cut, we know what sexual dimorphism looked like, even if it wasn't the same pattern as we see in humans today. Well, I can tell you from my research on Homo naledi that that's not the case. We actually only have four greater sciatic notches. They are the parts of the pelvis that preserve that are the best indicators of sex that we have in the sample. And as you can see from this picture, really only the one labeled A over there is uh, complete enough where you could actually tell is this wide or narrow. But you can't tell if it's wide or narrow within the context of this uh, species, uh, of this population, and you can't tell if this is something that um, was different between members of, different, of the different sexes. Uh, we don't know if this is just a wide-notched male, or if this is a wide-notched female, but there were also wide-notched males, or if this is a wide-notched female, and there are narrow-notched males that we haven't found, or that are maybe represented by some of these less complete notches here. So it's not just sample size that we need to worry about. In some ways, our ability to identify female-bodied individuals far into the past is very limited. Moving forward, there's a few things we need to stop doing. We need to stop assuming that motherhood is the only important part of female bodies. We really limit our scope when we do this, when we focus on just birth-related anatomy, and it's possible that we're missing other things that are impacting female bodies and how they evolved over time. We need to stop viewing female adaptations for birth as detrimental. We can't assume that just because there is an adaptation for birth, there is something uh, somehow wrong with the individual. And this ties into the next one, which is that we need to stop treating the male form as default. We can't assume that there's males, which are what the species look like, and then there's males who have, or, and then there's bodies that would look like males, except they have to be able to give birth, and so those are the females and are something different. We really need to stop doing this um, and think about questions that we can ask with the evidence that we have that isn't going to play um, the stereotypical gender roles of today into the past. Thank you. And we're actually going to hold questions to the end, I think, so ignore the questions part of this slide. Next up is Virginia Esterbrook. 
sorry, I'm getting this up, uh, presenting on bioarchaeology of gendered labor in the Middle and Upper Paleolithic. Okay. Is it stop? Nope. Crap. Oh. Hold on, sure. Continue? Yes. Okay, excellent. I'm not a Mac user. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about the bioarchaeology of gendered labor in the middle and upper Paleolithic, or rather how we search for potentially gendered labor in the middle upper Paleolithic, and actually how we sort of don't find it. Um, so the familiar story is that Neanderthals had a lot of trauma. And this is because many of the well-preserved Neanderthals show evidence of trauma. So if we think of all the skeletons that we have names for that represent sort of almost full or as full as we get um, skeletons we have, all of these have some trauma in them. However, um, most of them are males over 35 years, um, or almost 35, so Kabara is definitely an adult um, male. But so we're looking at this well-preserved sample of Neanderthals that have trauma, and we have this very weird age bias um, thing going on there, and possibly a sex bias um, or gender bias if we think about the presence of trauma as being an issue of labor in the past and representing what people were up to. So when people think about what women were doing in um, Neanderthal times or Upper Paleolithic times, generally people are not thinking a lot about um, what females were doing. So female trauma is often not differentiated from male trauma um, or it's not specifically addressed. So it's sort of lumped in with Neanderthal trauma. Um, and then when it is sort of thought of a little bit, um, it's thought of using mostly non-human primate models of what females might have been up to. So Binford's idea of Neanderthal nests, so the, the females stayed in the caves like um, gorillas stay in their nests or sort of had these nesting zones where women and their children sort of huddled in fear of extinction. Um, so <laughs> as far as approaches to Paleolithic gender, how do we even get to this? How can we look at differentiations um, of potentially gender roles, is it even possible to observe the impact biological sex had on social roles? Because our fossil record is really scrappy and we don't have a lot of individuals and we have very few individuals for which we can actually give a very accurate um, possible sex uh, determination on. So is it possible to even do this in um, the Middle Paleolithic given um, the sample available in any sort of statistically meaningful way? So this has kind of been an issue that I am really interested in, have worked um, a bit about. So do we see the impact, um, so if we do, if we think that we can actually do this, do we see the impact of biological sex in the fossil skeletal record in the Middle Paleolithic? And you know, do we see it in the Upper Paleolithic? Is it different um, between the two of them? So what we have for what we can look at is that skeletal remains themselves. So. Skeletal remains are our window into the past, um, especially in the Middle Paleolithic where we don't really have grave goods um, that can help us look at social roles that people might have played. Mostly we just have the bones of the people themselves and the things that they made, but generally the things that they made are not um, in good conjunction with the people who might have made them. So we have activities as recorded on human skeletal remains. So we've got possibly what people ate, their injuries, their diseases, also it, manners of death, age of death, and then finally biological sex. And um, as Caroline was discussing, a lot of our ideas about biological sex are based on ideas of dimorphism. And so even with pelvis, we have dimorphic issues which may or may not have played out in completely modern ways in the past. And certainly when we look at a lot of features, um, non-pelvic features, it gets even more muddied. So generally we assume the small ones are female and the large ones are male, and we sort of hope that what we're looking at is either a small one or a large one. And going forward with that, so we've got these, these issues with our sample, our really, really tiny, scrappy, um, fossil sample that we're looking at in the past. And so to get from that to gender, um, which requires a concept of social roles, is <laughs> um, 
challenging. So one of the things that I'd like to talk about is sort of for this work, it's looking at skeletal stuff, is recoupling, at least with limits, biological sex and gender. Because sort of in modern theory, gender has gone its sort of own direction. Gender is our social roles, biological sex is something else. So for our intents and purposes, not taking male as the default. So the biobehavioral role of sex in mammals is that females have the potential ability to conceive, bear, and give birth to offspring, provision those offspring through lactation into the weaning period, and have concomitant fluctuations in hormone levels that make all of this possible. So we've got all of these things going on with females, and you know we can look at males as not females. They don't have these things going on. They have no superpowers. Um, so we can look at gender as obviously an individual's social role within a group that's related to occupation, status, access to resources, all these social dimensions of how people behave um, with one another. And generally when we're looking at sex coupled with, or trying as a window to get to gender, looking at, um, we assume that the ability to conceive, bear, give birth to offspring, provision those offspring, blah, 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 has a huge impact on people's occupation, status, access to resources, et cetera. And sort of generally we see this play out in lots and lots of different ways in the human landscape as we know it as anthropologists. However, there's other biological factors that can also determine social roles that kind of get pushed aside a bit um, that I'd like to also address. So one of them is age class, um, which we will get into a little bit as well. So age class has a huge determinant on what kinds of roles people might be playing in their group, depending upon if you're a child, if you are a prime age adult, if you are an elderly person, all of these things might determine um, what your social role is in your group, as well as health status. So one of the things um, that could determine what people are up to is you know, potentially people that are too injured to do other things might take a different kind of role within their communities. And one of the things we definitely see in Neanderthals is very injured people that survived for a long time after their injury. So there's questions around what they were doing um, in the past too. So there's other, other biological factors in how people functioned in their group that it's important to consider. So our window, um, or the window that I've sort of chosen to look at this stuff, is through skeletal injuries. So skeletal injuries might be our best approach to something that's actually quantifiable and testable that we can look at as far as gendered labor, gendered bodies, um, stuff going on in the past. So we make some assumptions when we look at trauma. So first of all, just to define trauma, it's a pathological category defined as injury to a living tissue caused by an extrinsic force. There's lots of ways to get it. So objects used as weapons, but also hitting hard surfaces, large moving forces, as well as extremes of heat and cold. So all of these things can cause injury um, to people. So we've got all sorts of ways of trauma and oftentimes for some of these traumas, it's difficult to determine which one of these is actually going on. So possible sources of trauma. There's not just one source of trauma that's interpersonal violence. There's all sorts of other ways um, to be hurt, including occupational hazards um, and also environmental hazards. So depending on what you're doing, but also what the terrain is like, what, what kinds of things might present themselves as you're trying to move through terrain, not just what you're doing. So in order to look at trauma, we make some assumptions. We have a ground zero assumption which is that the skeletal sample represents a random sample of the population. And this is a fairly difficult assumption to make looking at the middle and upper Paleolithic. It's not, um, there's issues of what is a burial, what is not a burial. We, there's a lot of debate within the middle Paleolithic around what is a burial. So if we have certain individuals who are being deliberately buried, there are social reasons why they're being deliberately buried that make this a non-random sample. So, um, before we can even start to address you know, sort of differences in potential patterns of trauma between males and females, we need to know, are we looking at the same sample? So one way we do this is by um, assuming that an observed phenomena is considered a random sampling until that's disproven. So we, we're trying to disprove that what we are looking at um, is actually random sampling. And one of the issues that we have during um, the middle and also upper Paleolithic is tiny, tiny sample sizes that conventional statistics does not like. Um, so a way to work around this is um, 
through um, simulation of data sets. So um, a very nice tool for this is called ACTUS. It's analysis of contingency tables using simulation. Big mouthful there. Um, and it's um, created to address this issue of very small samples by using a random number generator to create um, comparable data sets and then compare those to what you have and see if these comparable sample data sets are weirder than what we see in, um, in our own sample. And we do this 10,000 times. So we can get really good idea around how weird, how much of an outlier what we're seeing actually is. And if it's not that much of an outlier, then we can assume that the variables are independent of one another within the contingency table, which is kind of cool. So this is um, what I used for some of my work looking at this. So within the European Neanderthal sample, we have, um, we're just looking at European Neanderthal sample because there's um, issues of attribution of, um, in um, West Asia around who's Neanderthal, who's actually not. Um, so out of 133 individuals with crania or postcrania, we only have 13 that can be attributed to a specific sex. And um, so of these, we can look at these and um, compare between males and females and um, what we find here is that although there's more males than females, it's not statistically significant. So we're sampling the same kind of pile, males and females. We are actually looking at a random sample, at least for our purposes going on here. We make a couple of other assumptions with trauma as well. The second, or the sort of one first assumption is that the frequency of injury within a group directly reflects the frequency of an individual's exposure to extrinsic hazards. So each individual bopping through the world, um, if they, they have this possibility um, of being injured, we're seeing this frequency of injury um, and looking at the frequency of injury in skeletal records. And because of this, we can assume that comparisons of frequency of trauma between groups reflect differences in relative exposure to hazards. So through this, we can compare what's going on with females and what's going on with males and try to get some idea of, are they dealing with the same kinds of hazards that are causing similar kinds of trauma? Going on. So when we look at the European, Neander the, the European Neanderthals, we can look at um, sex and trauma frequencies going on here. And what we see with this is the null hypothesis isn't rejected. So there's no statistical difference between the frequency of trauma in males and in females. So we're still, um, we're still looking at the same um, frequencies or not statistically discernible differences in frequencies in trauma between males and females. So we can look at distributions of trauma in Neanderthals as well. And for that, I actually added um, some of the um, West Asian Neanderthals in here as well. So we can look at distributions of trauma throughout the body um, in Neanderthals. And what we see is distributions of trauma by sex when we compare unidentified females and males is that, again, our hy null hypothesis that, all the, that trauma is independent of sex is not rejected. So um, there's no statistically significant difference in the distribution of trauma throughout the body in males and female Neanderthals, even though, you know, males have seven head injuries to females one and unidentified adults five, that's not enough to actually be statistically significant. Even though it looks really cool, it's not, it doesn't pass the statistical rigor test going on here. However, what does is when we look at distributions of injury by age at death class um, going on, so comparing adolescents prime age adults, so prime age adults defined by epiphyseal fusion to um, sort of 40-ish years old, so starting to some signs of osteoarthritis or senescence going on. Um, so prime age adults, sort of childbearing years and then older um, adults. And so one of the things we do see is that exposure to injury does differ by age um, at death class for Neanderthals. So these two variables are not independent, which sort of makes sense if you have accumulations of injury over your lifetime um, and survive them, which we do see in Neanderthals, which is very cool that uh, most of the injuries that older people, older Neanderthals have are injuries that they've had for a while that they've actually managed to survive, which is pretty cool. Um, so one of the ways to look at this is, um, okay, we're we just looking at lots of old males and only a few um, old females, and we have 12 old males and zero old females. Is this driving it? And turns out it's not um, what's driving it. So age at death class is independent of sex. Um, so our Neanderthal trauma conclusions is that male or female sex attribution is not shown to be statistically significant in the distribution of trauma in Neanderthals, but age at death class is, which is kind of interesting. And then do we see the same patterns in the upper Paleolithic? 
So we can look at trauma stuff going on with a bunch of individuals in the upper Paleolithic and look at similar measures. So distribution of trauma by sex. And this is also rejected. So the null, hypothe I'm sorry, the null hypothesis of um, independence is not rejected. So sex and distribution of trauma throughout the body is um, independent of sex. So males and females, even though it looks like there might be some issues, differences in distributions, it's not enough to actually be statistically significant. Going on there, however, when we look at distributions of injury by age at death class, um, the null hypothesis is rejected, although just barely. Um, so we've got distributions of trauma throughout the body depends upon the age of death class also during the upper Paleolithic, um, like it does during the middle Paleolithic. And so just to see if it's differences between males and females and adolescents, um, age of death class is independent of sex in this group as well. So the upper Paleolithic trauma conclusions are actually identical to the middle Paleolithic trauma conclusions in that male and female sex attribution is not shown to be statistically significant in the distribution of trauma in the European upper Paleolithic and age of death class is, which is kind of interesting through all of this. So the conclusions um, from this that we can sort of make are that the trauma injury data do not support statistically significant differences in frequencies or distributions of trauma between males and females in the middle and upper Paleolithic, nor an inference of gender division of labor based on differences in trauma patterns. So, you know, sort of the strange, rethinking Paleolithic roles one of the conclusions to this is it's a sampling issue. We've got really small samples. They're very difficult samples to deal with. We're just not seeing it because we just don't have enough data um, to make it significant. Or, um, you know, sort of another way of looking at this is maybe that social roles and distributions of labor actually were very different in the Paleolithic than our assumptions. That there are sort of very strictly defined gender roles where women sat in their little nests and men did the things. Um, so one of the things that um, came out in the last couple of years, which I thought was really cool, was um, work done um, by Snow et al. looking at sizes of hands and um, hand sizes and hand prints um, in an upper a few upper pillars of the caves. And what they found was that only 10% of the hand prints in the cave walls in Spain and France were left by adult males. 15% were placed by adolescent males, which leaves 75% of the hand prints as female, which is, which is a pretty cool conclusion. So I'd like to acknowledge lots and lots of people who had things to say and do for me, and I will drop this off for the next person. So I am pleased to welcome Kathleen Sterling, who's talking about In Search of Men in the Paleolithic. You know, if it's possible to turn off that screen or if you're going to just be stuck staring at me for 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. um, gender is such an integral part of modern Western life that we find it hard to imagine a human group that does not have a gender system. We imagine a gender system in the past that resembles our own based on two biological sexes with varying strengths and weaknesses, naturally. The ideology of the sexes is that, is that they are complementary, uh, but in reality we can all recite the many associated dichotomies, which are in fact opposites that exist in hierarchical relationships. We can add the dichotomy that the man is familiar and the woman strange. This is a direct reflection of the historical practices of the social sciences in general, and anthropology in particular. And despite the fact that feminist theory has been broadly transformative in archaeology, the Upper Paleolithic has benefited less from this transformation than more recent periods, however. The further back in time we look, the harder it seems to find the women. We have to search for women, but we always find men. This is explained away as an unfortunate effect of taphonomy that the best preserved archeological technologies are made of the hard, strong materials as opposed to the soft, ephemeral objects used by women. The association of stone tools with hunting and therefore male activity is something of a post hoc explanation and rather Freudian. The hard phallic blade penetrates the yielding flesh of the animal. Strength and power are integral to the tool or the man fulfilling its task. The descriptions of the hunt with dangerous, clever men confronting dangerous animals, violently taking life, 
bonding with each other and returning to the safety of hearth, home, and the open arms of the wife are part of a very particular construction of masculinity that is not at all natural, but naturalized. If little thought is given to what women might have been doing, there's little need to consider how they might have been doing it and what technologies would have been involved. Even working from a strict stereotypical gender ideology, the activities typically assigned to women would greatly benefit from, perhaps even require, the use of stone and bone tools. The transformation of plants and dead animals into food certainly requires the use of technology and technical knowledge. Why is it such a stretch then to imagine women as technical actors, not just as consumers, but as producers? We can imagine some perishable technologies for which we rarely have extant material evidence, um, though there may be ethnographic evidence, such as the use of hides to create shelters or clothing. We seem to reach the limits of what we are willing or able to imagine just before we get to what we assume women made or used that has since decomposed. One might argue that imagining women as technical actors and demonstrating that they were technical actors are two different things, and only the latter is science. However, this idea can be restated. We could say that imagining men as technical actors and demonstrating that they were are two different things, and only the latter is science. We might also say that imagining women weren't technical actors and demonstrating that they weren't are two different things and only the latter is science. What makes any of these statements more logical to us than the others is the assumptions that we have of human nature. Our inability to find Paleolithic women is entirely due to our present ideologies rather than the reality of the archeological record. A colloquial idea of evolution is prominent among these ideologies. As an explanation, we understand that biological and cultural factors that impede reproduction will be selected against. No matter how distasteful we might find feminism, racism, violence, or ignorance, if we see these modern problems as having advantages in the past, we can explain them away in the present as part of our nature, a burden of our shared ancestry that we must overcome. Even better, since we see growing numbers of people opposing such ideologies, this fits very nicely into our every, everyday idea of evolution as not just change over time, but improvement. Working from the known to the unknown, from the present to the past, present politically progressive change can be traced back to a more regressive era. Over such a mind-bogglingly long time, do we really need the details of the historical processes that unfolded to support this model? Isn't a female pharaoh, emperor, religious leader, or so soldier just anecdotal? The erasure of anyone we might now consider genderqueer is another casualty of simplistic evolutionary thinking. By privileging the reproduction of the individual rather than the group, there can be no place for deviation from the binary. If deviations existed, they just seem to be statistical noise that don't change the broader narrative. We also conflate our recent recognition and acceptance, however minimal, of gender nonconformity with having evolved a more enlightened attitude about difference. The past is often romanticized as a better, simpler time, but in this kind of model, the past is still simpler, but also more ignorant. Surely those cavemen could not have understood or accepted what we now call homosexuality, bisexuality, or polyamory. Another present factor that plays out in the past is the idea that women need to work twice as hard to get half the respect a man gets, and even then she will only get paid about three quarters as much. It might seem like a flip observation, but modern men are assumed to be competent until they are proved otherwise women must prove their competence. Paleolithic men are assumed to be survivors and providers. Women, with their burdens of reproduction and less muscle strength, must be proved to have been productive. The realities of modern women's lives are unthinkingly transposed back in time. Ideally, searching for Paleolithic women would mean that we could define, more or less, a category recognized by Paleolithic people that sufficiently overlaps with our concept of woman. 
We would also define other categories of persons recognized by Paleolithic people in ways that we could communicate using our often limited understanding of intersexual gendered identities and practices. This would be an extremely complicated and necessarily recursive project, and frankly, one that I'm not ready to tackle. There's still so much room to critique and to further develop the ways in which we engage with gender in the past. We can take difference seriously and argue for variability in identity using material evidence without assigning gender to materials. The results may not resemble what we expect from an analysis that organically integrates identity, but it is long past due that we recognize, question, and perhaps reject our expectations. But perhaps Paleolithic archaeology has already progressed, and I'm attacking a straw hominin. After all, the profession rarely uses the word man anymore to refer to humanity. Often, no gendered pronouns can be found at all in English language articles. Is this indicative of greater sensibility about what we can and cannot say about gender roles in the past? Or is it a sign of our reluctance to take a strong stand? So rather than searching for Paleolithic women, I decided that pondering the search for Paleolithic men might be a useful way to consider gender. What happens when we subject the evidence for men in the past to the same kind of scrutiny that we have traditionally used for women? So in this thought exercise, I had to consider whether and how to consider simple binary sex or gender. Should I employ traditional gender norms, either by following them, but insisting on a focus on the less prized activities, that is the woman the gatherer approach, or by flipping some or all of the activities typically associated with one sex to the other? Could the master's tools dismantle the master's house after all? Should I instead make an earnest effort to create a story with nuanced creative ideas of gender? Or would such an approach really just achieve the same outcome as a traditional approach that ascribes gender in the past to, that would support my own needs and is just as fictional? In the end, I decided that I would not repeat the usual approach, that is, of discussing Paleolithic gender in a way that is based on the mix of my cultural upbringing, personal ideologies, and selected ethnographies. That might have resulted in a more interesting story, but I would be speaking over rather than for Paleolithic people. Using traditional ideas about gender to look at the Paleolithic differently achieves something different. This brief description of Paleolithic life that follows is not actually about the Upper Paleolithic at all. It is about Upper Paleolithic archaeologists. So the following is a little story um, told with tongue firmly in cheek. It has long been a problem in prehistoric archaeology to identify the activities of men. The activities of women in the past can be easily discerned through the material culture they left behind. Women have always been very inventive and technologically inclined, and many of the raw materials and artifacts they used simply preserve better than those that men used. For example, we have points made of antler or stone that would have been hafted and used for multiple purposes. They would have been necessary to break up icy sediments to dig out roots, stone cobbles, and pigments, as well as serving a secondary function as a defensive weapon or even for hunting. Another example is the abundance of portable imagery from the Upper Paleolithic of Europe. The best known, perhaps the best made examples portray women. Given the Ice Age climate, few men would have had the opportunity to study the female form long enough to get the anatomical details correct, while a woman would be intimately familiar with them. It is hard to imagine why men would want or need such objects anyway. Women were almost certainly the producers of parietal imagery as well. Looking at modern Western women's and men's hands and comparing them to the handprints on cave walls such as Snow et al. have done, we can also assume that women produced rock art. Ethnographically, we see that women and older children bear the primary responsibility of the care and feeding of children and the elderly and typically work cooperatively, cooperatively to do so, which accounts for the hearths and faunal remains and other evidence that we find at archaeological sites. 
Ethnographic evidence also shows us that men spend a great deal of time in domestic settings socializing with each other when they're there, um, discussing abstract ideas, but spend very little time directly fulfilling the economic needs of the group. Therefore, the material remains we have must be due to women's economic activities. Because of men's biological limitations in reproduction, we can't even see their presence in domestic settings, which are the vast majority of Paleolithic archaeological sites. The fact that many modern men contribute to housekeeping and child rearing is evidence of how far we have come as a species. Since we do not have many Upper Paleolithic burials, we are further limited in what we can say about men's gender roles in the past. The presence of women at archaeological sites is obvious. It's common sense, given their central and crucial roles in society. Unless we can find clear evidence of men's activities in the past, perhaps using some new theoretical or methodological development that can help us with gender determination, they will remain a bit of a mystery only peripherally participating in the human evolutionary journey. What might this evidence look like? Well, if we could find objects that could only be used by men, though it is hard to imagine what that might be, that would help. If we found a Paleolithic Pompeii, where people died instantly in the midst of daily life, that would go a long way as well toward explaining what men did in the past. So this is clearly an absurdist approach though there's nothing in it that was truly implausible. The result was still a very flat story of the past, a one that is so thoroughly suffused with modern gender ideology that it serves more to obscure than enlighten. To ask what Paleolithic women did, or what Paleolithic men did, or where Paleolithic women or men were is to ask the wrong questions. Rather, we need to look at multiple scales to investigate how Paleolithic people lived their lives and guard against not only applying modern identity politics in the past, but also against assuming that Paleolithic identities were static across time and space or along the individual life course. Thank you. Those were some interesting talks. I now want to invite Sylvia Tomaskova to the stage to discuss them for us. Thank you. Well, first of all, it's really amazing to be um, commenting on a panel of such not just smart, but really funny women. And that is a great pleasure. When Carolyn asked me to be a respondent on a session titled In Search of Paleolithic Women, I had several immediate reactions. The first one was incredulity. I thought, really? Is this what we are still talking about some 30 years after the emergence and even an enthusiastic embrace of gender archaeology? To paraphrase Meg's 2003 article, has feminism not changed archaeology? However, if the organizers decided to have a search for women in the Paleolithic, the answer is most likely no. Not all is well with Paleolithic women. And we all have to pitch in and take the issue seriously. I will start with the positive and optimistic, partly from current Paleolithic research, partly from the presentations. They all confirm the good news. It is clear that there were women in the Paleolithic. possibly half the population. <laughs> they lived and died. Some had ordinary ho-hum kind of lives. Others, judging from some of the evidence of trauma, lived in pain for at least a part of their lives. Some lived to be quite old. Some gave birth, even if Carolyn cautions us not to assume much from that about being mothers, not to mention what kind of mothers. And that is the end of good news. <laughs> Therefore, we have to continue to think about and speak out about the persistent patterns of ignoring women in distant prehistory, generalizing about them from observations of other primates. 
Women's must be close to baboons or chimps because they give birth and have leaky bodies, being so corporeal and so irrational. There's plenty of feminist literature in history, philosophy, or sociology that deals with the fear, envy, or the gender, general discomfort of the female body that we as archaeologists may draw upon. However, our unique expertise and perspective does not reside in tracing, tracing present-day women back into the past to prove that they lived meaningful lives, mattered in the grand scheme of evolution, and contributed equally to the survival of the fittest. That is evolutionary theory at its most ideological, supporting the present as inevitable and unquestioned and only possible outcome. I will therefore structure my response in terms of why and how. And as you may suspect, each of these simple questions is actually multilayered and peels into another set of questions. But there is no simple way around it. And besides, women are good at meticulous, small tasks that take years or decades. So the why. I suggest we start with Meg's very serious question. What do we want from making women visible? It is imperative that we do not end with this effort. We have shown that women were there, but make it the baseline of a larger point, or as the papers in this session suggest, several larger points. History and sociology of science give plenty of substan uh, substantiation that evidence and facts are constructed in a specific context. The archaeological record is made based on research questions, questions that change with the accumulation of new evidence, but even more questions change depending on who gets to ask those questions. Thus, the making of Paleolithic women visible is not necessarily about those women per se. Did anyone really doubt that they were not there? It is a mirror of our discipline, the research focus, and the presentism of not just the interpretation, but more importantly, of the questions asked. The search for Paleolithic women exposes the ideological nature of scientific research. However, I do not mean the statement as an indictment of impure science in need of, an, of a corrective exposure of Nazi misuse of archaeology, for example. To the contrary, I wish to stress that all science is cultural practice. We can only dream of or be curious about that which we have heard about, have imagined, and therefore should interrogate. With my own research on the gender of shamans in Siberia, I found historical records of 18th century German scientists who believed that a Siberian man could turn into a woman because these scientists did not think of the natives as fully human. Thus, these people were thought of as capable of anything, any kind of transfiguration. Moreover, they did not consider the ritual performances as true religion. Therefore, even women could do it. And finally, their own church back in Hawa was just going through a highly contentious debate with a French group who suggested that after death, everyone, men and women, turn into women in afterlife. Siberian transgender shamans were the most obvious evidence, a proof in front of their very eyes. Lest you think of all oh, those 18th century naives. The late 19th century ethnographers of an even more remote Eastern Siberia also believed in the possibility of gender change partly because they were revolutionaries and they fervently, sincerely wished for social change. Primitive communism and ancient societies as a return to equality. A ritual performer who'd fly, turn into a woman, and heal miserable skin rash fit the bill. This is to say that it is not the, vis the visibility of Paleolithic women that is an issue. Rather, it is the nature, the composition, the structure of our discipline that comes into focus. The questions that we ask are not driven by the archaeological record. The latest discovery, they're our own creations. They're the result of our impertinent curiosity, the, what, the one that killed the cat. And we need to make that aspect of our own work visible. 
so now to the how. Once we have exhausted everyone with the theoretical critique, it is our responsibility, it is our next assignment to suggest how to move in a new direction or directions, to offer alternatives, if nothing else, to our students or to those who are on board with the critique. I will therefore follow Kathleen's lead here and ask whether, pe whether Paleolithic men are visible. If the brawny, muscled hunters who always knew their lithic sources had a choice of tools on hand at all times, knew the migratory route of every animal is really the image we can live with. This is a very sorry state of a discipline. Consider seriously and thoughtfully not whether men or women are visible in discussions of the very distant past, but whether humanity is really visible. And I mean here humanity in the literal sense, as humans, but also humanity in all its strength and frailty, health and sickness, joy and sorrow. I suggest that gender be set aside as our goal and we take up feminist archaeology and give attention to all that lived lives of the Paleolithic. We heard excellent presentations in this session on how little we have to go on when discussing individual bodies. If so few can be sexed, should we back up and start from a different angle and work our way to a social being rather than an individual? I suggest that our modern notion of a person as an individual body with a coherent sense of self and an identity may be the obstacle to a discussion of lives in the Paleolithic. A more productive path forward may be an inquiry into social beings, people who lived together, learned from each other, fed each other, shared or hoarded, traveled or stayed in a place. How many? How far? so that we can come closer to an individual. I suggest to make the familiar, the person, the family, as strange as possible. And only after we ask these rudimentary and outlandish questions, then we take the next step and evaluate the archeological record. When discussing Paleolithic lives, what kind of social forms are we talking about? Extended families? What was the bond that tied people together? I do not suggest this as an interpretive move. It is too late by then, in my view. But as a hypothesis testing, an interrogation of our own concepts of the basic building blocks of any society, and then testing them against the archaeological record. If this still sounds too theoretical, which I'm sure it does, I would argue that you all have, in your presentations, already taken some of the steps. I suggest that we take the body seriously and literally. The presentations showed us how minuscule the skeletal record is, yet how far it has gotten for some. But similarly to the individual, we should back away from a single skeleton and ask all of them, present and missing, some body parts, and ask them seemingly simple questions by interrogating abilities and skills of those bodies. Can a very young body walk this far? A very old body walk up a steep hill? Can a small hand, an arthritic hand, an unskilled hand make a stone or a bone or a wooden tool? And of course, how did anyone learn anything? Both in a social sense, observation, which means presence at any activity, so people have to be there in order to watch. Trial, error, bodies are not born fully ready to function and work. They have to acquire skills, knowledge, and practice. Where is the archaeological record of that? It is the variability of skills and abilities that we should think about. Not only how do children learn, but also not everyone learns to perfection. And my drawing skills are a living proof of that. Where is the archeological record of that? Finally, the perception of bodies in an area that Paleolithic archeologists have uh, avoided as it is not material visible are the senses. Really? Hearing, seeing, smelling, touching, 
are all subjective experiences and they are at the same time objective bodily functions. A cave is a very different environment than an open air site where sounds echo and resonate differently, where its sight has to be assisted through touch, walking along the walls and memorizing them, or through the use of torches, lamps, or anything that emits light. Rivers, forests, shores are overwhelmingly sensory environments that if we try, have material correlates in terms of how bodies experience them how people adjust through inventions, gadgets, tools. Adaptation to ecological niches is very real, but we need to broaden our imaginaries to ask questions about human experience of these places. The study that showed that hand stencils in caves were possibly made by women is adding women, but it's not even stirring them. Women were made visible, and that should make us feel better. Yet the missing fingers, the fact that these hands are touching the walls and spitting paint is left unexamined. The past seems so comfortably familiar and that may be the problem. The work ahead of us is actually really exciting, but we need to dare to interrogate not just the evidence that's given to us. We have to stop and rethink the continuous presentism. We have to try to question the present and ask different questions. Consider that the past was possibly very different from the present. Thank you. And now for our final discussant, Karen Rosenberg. Of course, you've seen the first one, but it's a popular image. Yeah. Can we get the slides back? Great. It's very bright up here. I had no idea. So I want to start by thanking Caroline and Virginia. Um, the organizers of this symposium for putting together such a great group of inspiring and insightful speakers searching for women in the Paleolithic. I try most of the time to avoid sounding like an old fart, but I think today I'm going to fail a little bit. It's hard to believe that 30 years ago, when I was in graduate school, no one to my knowledge had ever drawn a reconstruction of an ancestral human being having a baby or even being pregnant two events in female life history that we know are relatively risky, and hence times when we can really see selection and operation. I used to say that what I liked about studying the anatomy of the birth canal was that one could visualize selection and operation much more graphically than we could when we were talking about a millimeter or two of enamel on a molar. In, in any case, in spite of this close connection to selection, although there was some work, ooh, I failed here. Um, on childbirth in Australopithecines by the time of the late 80s, there wasn't much more. As far as I know, it wasn't until 1989 that a picture of a pregnant Australopithecine was published. This one, which Melanie and Caroline and maybe some other people showed in their presentations. I think it's from an illustrated guide to human evolution by Peter Andrews and Chris Stringer. And then again in 2007, oh, wrong. Um, yeah, in 2007, in this um, picture by John Gertie, which was published in Nature when Catherine Whitcomb's work on the effects of pregnancy on women's walking was published. Today, it's hard to describe to the younger generation how shocked I was, in a good way, but shocked, when I first saw the picture of the pregnant Lucy, and of course, in addition, when I wondered why I hadn't thought of publishing something like that, even though I was working on the evolution of human childbirth at the time. While I'm on the subject of childbirth, which is a comfortable place for me, I want to mention a couple of small issues. Caroline mentioned in her paper that parturition scars are not found on fossil pelvis. 
parturition scars are bony changes on the pelvis that people have claimed for a long time are evidence of the trauma of childbirth. Clearly, there's some problems with the simple association between these scars and parity, as she indicated, but I wonder if, if they do reflect trauma and strain of childbirth in some way, whether their absence might indicate that prior to very recent times, childbirth was somewhat easier than it is today. The second thing that I wanted to mention about birth has to do with the so-called obstetrical dilemma. The idea, going back to Sherry Washburn, that the human pelvis, and in particular the birth canal, represents a compromise between adaptation to bipedal locomotion and giving birth to large brain babies. There's been some criticism of this concept recently with the suggestion that the proximate trigger for childbirth, for starting labor, is metabolic needs of the growing fetus and the inability of the mother to continue to supply them. I don't think those explanations are mutually ex exclusive, but I want to mention a slightly different issue Large brains are not the only things that represent obstetrical constraints. Wendy Trevathan proposed a long time ago that the wide, rigid shoulders that humans have also present a challenge to birth, resulting today in shoulder dystocia. We know that Australopithecines gave birth in a way that was neither like modern humans nor like modern apes. Um, and this isn't surprising, given that their mosaic of features is not like any living species. But it, what it does mean is that the massive morphological restructuring of the pelvis for bipedalism had obstetrical consequences. Even though these early human ancestors didn't have large brains, they had already experienced evolution in the area of obstetrics because of the changes that happened for locomotion. This could be relevant for um, something that Caroline mentioned about the sediba material, which shows some modern pelvic features in spite of having small brains. So thank you there for indulging my obsession with the evolution of childbirth. Um, although it may be hard to locate women in the archaeological record, I am sure that we have them in the fossil record, as Caroline and Virginia showed, and as Sylvia just mentioned as well. Um, I might mention one more thing about the pelvis, which is the issue of male and female locomotor efficiency, which Caroline talked about. She described recent research by Warriner suggesting that there's no difference between male and female locomotor efficiency. I'm deeply skeptical about this, if only because the pattern of sexual dimorphism that we see in the pelvis in humans today is the reverse of what we see in the rest of the body. Females actually have some larger dimensions, have larger dimensions on average than males. Caroline's critique of using modern sexing standards in the past reminds me of the work of Lori Hager, often overlooked. She argued many years ago that if the modern pattern of sexual dimorphism in the pelvis is a response to the constraints of modern childbirth, we can't extrapolate to use those standards um, back to a time when the constraints of childbirth were different. I very much appreciated Meg and Melanie's recognition that we may have found women in the Paleolithic context where we may have found them where they actually weren't present. Um, we've probably not only failed to find women where we should have, but we may have also found them where we shouldn't. Um, but what about gender? So I was giving a talk a little while ago in a forensic science class at my university, and at the end of the lecture, the professor, not one of the students, but the professor raised his hand, and he said, do anthropologists prefer the term sex or gender? And I kind of gave a big sigh. And obviously, in anthropology, we know much better than that. And we recognize that culture is, that gender is culturally defined. But I'm actually skeptical about our ability to identify gender in the fossil record. I think we do a pretty good job identifying sex in the fossil record, not a perfect one. And there's still a lot that we don't know. Um, for example, what do we know about sexual dimorphism in pelvic morphology and australopithecines? Really, nothing, um, I think. As far as I know, there's only one way to find out somebody's gender today, and that is not to look at them, even in the flesh and with cultural cues supplied. Um, it's to ask them. Um, and obviously, we can't do that with the fossil record. We have to ask them. And this is increasingly complicated in society today, as Meg mentioned. It's playing out in all kinds of issues, including who can go in which bathroom. 
So though I try to be a pretty positive and optimistic person, and I actually think we have a really good fossil record, not a crummy fossil record as some people suggested, um, but I wonder if we're ever really gonna be able to look at gender in the archeological or fossil record. I don't think it's that the fossil record is scrappy. I think we may be asking a question that we can't answer. Of course, I do think we've made a lot of progress in including women in our evolutionary narratives, a very positive development. Um, my enthusiasm is tempered a little bit with my concerns that we continue to kind of impose gender stereotypes on sex roles in prehistory. Um, Meg and Kathleen made this point in their presentations. I don't think we're better off finding women in the Paleolithic if we find them only in terms of modern Western stereotypes, a kind of Wilma Flintstone. Um, I wasn't going to mention names, but I guess I'm thinking about people like Owen Lovejoy, whose inclusion of women in his model of hominin origins seemed in some ways to come out as 1950s housewives waiting for their guys to bring home the bacon in exchange for sexual favors and faithfulness. This doesn't seem like progress in finding women in prehistory. We've been fighting against gender stereotypes in our own lives for so many decades. And like many of the speakers who spoke today, I'm really troubled that even after all this time, we so often seem willing to apply those stereotypes uncritically to the past. So thank you. Do we have time for, com Do we have time for questions? Anybody? What happens now? Milford? Ooh, do I? I'm not the moderator. But. What, what, why is this happening? How can people be thinking about males all the time when these are clearly problems about women? And I said, all you can do is graduate, become professionals, and start addressing women's issues as women, because the men aren't going to do it. I think that was right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, why don't you guys come up here? Come on, all of you. I don't want to be up here alone. <laughs> Thank you, Milford. Is this on? Oh, there we go. Thank you, Milford. And we graduate and set up sessions like this. Are there any other questions that we can address? <laughs> now that we're up here. I know, we're kind of like blinded, so if you could move to the uh, microphones, that would be great, because we totally can't see hands. <laughs> okay, we have somebody coming. Okay. I know. <laughs> Hello, um, yeah, so I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I'm very happy I took Meg Conkey's class since 1994 in Berkeley. <laughs> and, uh, but, um, so can we or can we not identify sex in for example, Neanderthals or early hominids? It depends on what your criteria are. Um, if your criteria are, okay, so going off the greater sciatic notch thing, a wide one is female and a narrow one is male. If you find a wide, a pelvis with a wide greater sciatic notch, then you can call that female. If your criteria is you have to actually set up what dimorphism looks like in the species, there are some fossil species where that's much harder to do because we don't have good examples of both sexes. Neanderthals, I think it's, we are able to do it, um, maybe not always using the exact same techniques as we do with uh, humans today because there are some differences in their pelvis. But going further back in time, especially in the Australopithecus early record, it's much harder to do. Okay, thank you. And just one, so just to be clear, so if a student asks me, can we look for gender in the Paleolithic record 
What do we say? <laughs> you say, what do you mean by gender? <laughs> Let me just um, follow up your first question, if I may, and then, Kath, I know you want to answer this last question. Um, given the, the contemporary understanding now that we actually have of intersex people, um, I just wondered you know, whether there was any conversations among biological anthropologists about um, the manifestations of potentially intersex people, given that we now know that there's quite an, a large a number of them in contemporary society. So maybe, and you know, undergraduates get very nervous um, about this when you tell them in the room that a certain percentage of you are probably intersex and they just, who, not, not me, you know, they're all looking at each other, which is understandable because it's a very um, personal and very difficult sort of subject. But I just wondered, you know, again, there's this whole sort of notion that the world has always been divided into very clear categories, um, recognizable, embodied, kinds of things. So has biological anthropologists dealt with this? Well, that, that was actually something I wanted to mention, is that um, with the increasing use of ancient DNA, uh, we're, we can get chromosomal sex, and it's not always going to be XX or XY, and that doesn't even begin to address sex anymore. Um, I don't think biological anthropology recognizes just two sexes anymore. And then if asking if we can see gender in the past is asking a completely different question. Although sometimes I've seen in Science Magazine even that they talk about the gender of, of, a, of a virus or the gender of bacteria. And I go, oh, I'm interested in their social performances, right? <laughs> Actually, I just wanted to mention um, that uh, the triple burial at Domi Vesnitsi, Vlad um, Vladimir Novotny actually said the central individual was intersex. He suggested that as a hypothesis probably 25 years ago. Yeah. I don't know. Based on what skeleton? Um, there's something odd about that skeleton. It's very small. Yes. It has oh, some okay, pathology. Sure. It's okay. right. And so that was his that was his explanation. I'm not particularly supporting it, but I just. <laughs> But also what we're trying to get at in the past, when asking about gender in the past, is there, are there different roles that were considered male roles and female roles? And the way we could address that is, you know, sort of by some sort of physical evidence of labor being divided that way. So either differences in how people were hurt making their way around the world, which we don't seem to see, or we don't see in a way that we can statistically show um, as a thing. Um, you know, sort of ways that we could see that division or division in roles is how we would establish that gender looked the way we think about gender now. question for Virginia. Um, I recently defended a dissertation and talked about male and female roles, and somebody in the audience, Sylvia, <laughs> um, <laughs> said, okay, you have male and female individuals and indeterminate individuals, <coughs> and when you're thinking about roles by sex, what are you doing with all those indeterminate people? Are they playing into the statistical comparison, or are they just left out? So I guess you may have addressed this, but when you were looking at trauma between males and females, were the indeterminates part of that, or were they kind of hanging out uh, out of the analysis? Um, they were part of the analysis. Oh, okay. So they were um, unidentified adult. Oh, okay, okay. So they were also statistically insignificant between all the Yeah, yeah so there was the um, unidentified adult category, and basically all three of these categories, there was just, there was no discernible statistically significant difference between what was going on in the distributions of trauma or the frequency of trauma in, in those categories. Okay, yeah, I guess I'm just kind of continuing to think about like if there's a way, like we have male and female, and in bioarchaeology, of course, you have your probable males and probable females as well. If there are more interesting ways, maybe like Sylvia was saying, to think about social beings, right, to, to separate these individuals as opposed to just binary categories with like this third other. <laughs> yeah. I um, like, I like age classes. I think age yeah. classes are actually really interesting. And the fact that in Neanderthals, we have a lot of these well-preserved older males that have mostly, mostly have a lot of trauma that they have survived. When you look at the larger sample of Neanderthals, the frequency is not actually that high or that different from any other hunter-gatherer group, but when you're just looking at these ones that were probably buried or possibly buried, um, they do have a high amount of trauma. So did these men who survived into older age in Neanderthals 
and were deposited in some way that allowed us to find them um, in a higher levels of preservation than we see with other, um, other individuals, did being hurt create a role for them, possibly, in ways that they might not have had otherwise? So It's the, called assisted living. Yeah. Well, but or, or they had a role that was a leadership, administrative role. Yeah, Jean Al wrote about that. <laughs> I want to ask about the power of storytelling. Um, it seems to me that one of the things that confounds the stuff that you would like to know about is the very lack of evidence, right? You, um, but people want us in this discipline, in your discipline, to tell stories, tell us what life was like, tell us about men and women, um, in part because those categories inform so much of what contemporary people experience in their life. So. How do we resolve the tension between the kinds of stories that we think we're capable of telling, right? Maybe the more interesting stories that we could talk about in terms of age roles or the human stories that we want to tell um, rather than male stories or female stories with the desire that people have from looking at archaeology for us to tell those stories. We want to tell different stories. We get pulled back into the desire to tell these more conventional stories. But there are other people who want different stories, right? What about people who are genderqueer now who would like to be able to imagine themselves um, existing in the past and the, and the power of that? So I just, it, what do you do with that? Well, I think what we have to recognize um, in telling the stories is the ways in which the people of the past, whatever categories they themselves had or enacted in their lives, um, they had to be cooperative, they had to work together, they had to be social beings, they had to figure out ways of complementarity to get things done, otherwise, you know, none of us really would be here. Um, and I think there's a lot of stuff that we can read. Um, I think Joan Roughgarden, for example, her work on uh, aspects of sexuality across the animal kingdom and so forth are giving us some ideas about how um, the whole varieties of human experience and human identities and so forth actually, you know, can be found and understood in, in broader terms. So I think there's another whole kind of literature that we can draw on that people have, have um, embraced and uh, really done some really fine empirical work. But I think stressing the kinds of things that needed to happen in order for those folks to, to do what they did, even if they failed in many instances. Um, and you know, like this business about um, a lot of um, elder males uh, with lots of lifelong tra you know, trauma you know, suggest that there was really something to the social group to sustain those kinds of individuals. So I think those are the kinds of stories that I think we can tell um, that would be re really useful, even if we can't say, you know, as Joan Jarrow and I found out when, you know, in the late 80s when we convened the conference that became the book Engendering Archaeology, uh, Time Magazine was very interested in the, con in the conference. They called up and they asked us, were we going to be able to demonstrate that women invented this, that, or the other thing? We said no. They said, okay, we're not interested, right? So, you know, but I think we did a lot of other kinds of things um, in, in many sort of important ways that uh, made people start thinking about things differently. And I think that's what we really have to do is make people start thinking about things differently, including the ways in which we relate to each other in our own everyday lives. Well, I have a comment about that too, actually, because one of the things that I find I encounter a lot is that um, the kinds of questions that people want us to answer are in large part questions that are impossible to answer. They're just impossible to answer. And um, an advisor of mine, who some of you know really well, used to answer a lot of these questions with, you know, it would be nice if we had a time machine because then I could answer that question for you. And I think to a certain extent, this is a failure of science education in general, that people kind of don't really understand how science works. They don't understand that there are certain questions that you need certain types of data to answer. And they also don't understand that new data can change your interpretations of things. So they want definitive answers to these very difficult questions without necessarily being able to comprehend the nuances of why you can't answer that question and why that doesn't mean that we don't know anything. So um, I think we as scientists and as researchers, it's our responsibility to sort of weave these narratives together in ways that are compelling but that are also responsible in a scientific sense. I think it's also important to think about the motivation for asking those kinds of questions. 
that people are looking to uh, the Paleolithic for what is natural about people, you know, hence the paleo diet and um, evolutionary psychology and everything else um, that just sort of unthinkingly goes from what we've got going on in the present back to the past or just imagines what was going on in the past as being what we should be doing now. Is there time for one more question? Yeah, I think we can do one more. Okay. Um, I, I'm an anthropologist, <laughs> so I'm a bit of a stranger in the room. But I did do both archaeology and physical anthropology in my undergraduate degree. And in this whole session, which I found absolutely fascinating, there's been one very interesting silence for me, and that is the phrase ethnographic parallels. I mean, you've talked a lot of, um, about the... the the dangers of projecting backwards from our society to gender roles in the Paleolithic, but is it, no, is it completely unfashionable now to look at modern hunter-gatherer societies for parallels for, because you're looking at societies where the sort of economic basis of survival is similar, and, and therefore possibly there might be something about the gender roles in those societies that at least is something that can be thrown into the mix. Well, I would start by saying that um, ethnographic uh, research is very important for archaeologists, but not necessarily for the, the reasons that it used to be, which is using it as an analogy that uh, whatever happens in this society, because the, there's snow and ice, that's just like the Paleolithic. Um, but rather, what I would say is that we ask research questions based on our own experiences, knowledge, and frame of reference. And therefore, we need to look at other societies and other ways of being in order to ask different questions. Um, I don't think that there are many archaeologists who still believe that uh, any society in the Arctic was sort of untouched by modernity. They're all parts of state. They all use vehicles as well as hunt and therefore taking the roles and just sort of mirroring them into the past. Uh, I don't think it's a very common practice, but I do think that it's very important for our own imagination and our own asking questions and sort of troubling our notion of what is normal and common. For that, seeing as many ethnographic cases is incredibly valuable. But also recognizing who's writing the ethnographies, what questions they're asking, what questions they're not asking. So we really have to look at the ethnographies as a cr in a critical sense as well. But I think that's pretty well understood by, by most of us. Okay, I think we are pretty fairly over time, so we'll wrap up here. Thank you all for coming. Um, yeah.